Good morning, church. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Metuchen on this beautiful Sunday. Happy Mother's Day. Great to see you all here. If you would like to be in worship next Sunday, you all know the drill. Please call the church office by noon on Friday or register online. We also welcome to our congregation members of the Absecon Presbyterian Church. They are joining us by way of Facebook Live this morning. On this Mother's Day, we are giving thanks for this congregation, for your support of the Church World Service Blanket Fund. Between your donations and Presbyterian Women's donations, we are sending $1,635 for blankets in Church World Service. So well done. Thank you so much. We are in need of more volunteers to operate our live streaming service, and my pitch is, if you ever are not a fan of anything Fred or myself says, you have the power of turning off the camera. If that entices you, please see Jane Meyer or Gail Stein. It's very easy to run. Again, power is in your hands. We're selling Krispy Kreme donuts now through the middle of June, so if you would like a box or 12, please uh, contact the church office. They'll connect you with the youth who will be selling. We will be uh, distributing those donuts the day before Father's Day, so just to give you a hint when all those donuts are coming. Also, this is my favorite announcement of the day, our youth mission trip 30th anniversary t-shirts are here. Yes, this is our 30th anniversary. So pretty standard on the front. We all know what that means. But on the back, this is where things are really neat. Uh, design of a house, and it says you can't really explain it. You have to experience it. But what there are that outlines the house is 441 names. These are all of the participants, youth and adults, from the past 29 years. Their names are on the shirt. And if you were wondering, yes, the Walters make up two whole lines <laughs> as a foundation of this. Uh, $20 per shirt, I am willing to negotiate if you buy more than three. They're in the church office. There are still a few spots left on our adult mission trip taking place May 31st through June 5th. So if you've always wanted to work with Habitat and not with teenagers, this is the trip. Wheels to Worship, this is an interfaith event we are doing uh, with other houses of worship in town where we bike around. I think that's all I really need to say. There are more details in the Sunday paper. The registration deadline is May 14th. There will be a vigil for healing against hate crimes and violence for our Asian American and Indonesian community. This will take place next Sunday, 5 p.m. on the church front lawn. We hope you consider joining us for this important service. After worship, please consider sticking around and having some after worship refreshments, socially distanced on the front lawn. It would be great to see you all there. And with that, please stand if you are able. Join me in our call to worship. Sing to our God a new song. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let us worship God. Please be seated.
If we say we have no sin in the truth, it's not in us. Yet if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So to find that freedom, let's join our voices together today and confess our sins before God and one another. Loving God, we have not loved you or each other with our whole hearts. You command us to abide with and live into your love. We instead choose apathy over empathy. We choose to not bear fruit. Forgive us, we pray, and lead us toward wholeness, that we may be filled with your joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The freedom that we look for is to walk beyond guilt. The freedom that we should hope for is to lay, a shot, lay aside the trust of shame. Let that be our path today. May you find the freedom to rise above. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Hello, my young friends. Welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary and welcome to those here visiting virtually with us this morning. This year, Vacation Bible School will take place on June 28th to July 1st. We are excited to be in person and COVID careful. We will be limiting class sizes, so please sign up today. The registration forms are in the Church Narthex, the main office, and also online on our website. And now I'm very excited to introduce the VBS Workshop of Wonders drama team and this year's puppet, Rivet, who is our church carpenter aunt. Hello, friends. Welcome to the WOW Workshop of Wonders, where we imagine and build with God. I know how it looks. You probably want to say, but Sandy, all you've got is regular old stuff. And if you said that, well, you'd be exactly right. But here's the deal. When we imagine with God, we don't just see things for how they look. We see what they can be. Even the ordinary can be extraordinary. So everybody, put on your Wonder Vision goggles. Oh, oh wait, <laughs> that's right. You don't have your Wonder Vision goggles yet, but you do have great imaginations. So make one hand like this, everybody do that, and then make the other hand like this, everybody do that, great, and then put those up to your eyes like this. All right, now imagine how something ordinary like a little ant might look through your goggles. Can you see it? No? You can't see it? Can't see it? Oh, wait, I forgot. We have to turn our goggles on by saying, Wonder Vision. Ah! Can you all say that with me? Ready? Wonder Vision. Ah! Do you see anything yet? <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so yes, everyone, this is my good friend, Rivet the Ant. Everybody say, hi, Rivet. A visioneer is someone who has lots of ideas, someone like you. Are you letting them do the whole Wonder Vision goggles thing? Sure thing, Rivet. And have you told them what they've been seeing without their goggles? Um, not yet. Well, please be sure so they don't get stuck like that. Okay, if you still have your goggles up, you can put them down now. That's an excellent idea, my little ant friend. Now, we're going to use a different kind of vision. First, I need to make some adjustments on Rivet's thinking cap. Let's see. Okay. Good. M3000? Um, I'm going to use the Ant Cam 3000. Let me see. Yes, 
it will give us an ANSI view of whatever you look at. We'll get an ANSI view of whatever rivet looks at through the AntCam 3000. Cool, huh? Great. So what do you want me to look at? I want you to go to the laboratory of one of my great heroes, the great inventor, Dr. Wow. And we will watch from the monitor. Well, you want me to spy on Dr. Wow? Not spy, just observe. We've got all this great stuff in here in the workshop and plenty of imagination. And you'd like to get some good ideas by watching how Dr. Wow works. Exactly. Now, remember, you're just there to observe. Try not to say anything or touch anything that might affect Dr. Wow's work. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. I can count on you. Perfect. Use your tunnel system so you can get there and back quickly. See you soon. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Goodbye to you too, Rivet. Okay, Rivet should be there any second. Let's watch on the monitor and see what Rivet sees. Okay, so throughout the WOW workshop, you all will get to experience many ways you can imagine with God through the AntCam 3000 as you see here, snaking through our space today. We will get to watch Dr. Wow and Sam demonstrate some fascinating experiments. And as long as we have you here this summer, this truly will be a workshop of wonders. I mean, think about it. Isn't it totally cool that we get to use Rivet's AntCam 3000 to see inside Dr. Wow's lab of awesomeness? I'm happy to do it, Sandy. I love watching Dr. Wow and Sam build things together. It's going to be a great summer imagining all the things we can build with God. Will you all pray with me? Dear God, thank you for building a world full of wonder. Thank you for all the people who have put together their imaginations to create a fun place for us to gather together this summer. Help us listen to you so that we can use our imaginations to live in such a way that our love for others shines bright. Amen. See you all soon. Well, I feel a little mundane right now. That was excellent. That was fun. I'm really looking forward to VBS now. <laughs> this is the first scripture reading. This is taken from uh, 1 John chapter 5. Listen for the word of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this, we know that we love the children of God. And when we love God and obey his commandments, for the love of God is this. We obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me wings. And if I were a robin in a 
tree. I thank you, Lord, that I could sing. And if I were a fish in the sea, I'd wiggle my tail and I'd giggle with glee. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me a child. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. If I were a wiggly worm, I thank you, Lord, that I could squirm. And if I were a crocodile, I thank you, Lord, for my big smile. And if I were a fuzzy wuzzy bear, I thank you, Lord, for my fuzzy wuzzy hair. And I just thank you, Father, for making me me. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me a child. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. Don't really need a sermon after that. Well done, Taylor. Second scripture reading for this morning comes from John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. Hear now the word of God. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I've heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you may ask in my name. I am giving you these commands that, so that you may love one another. The word of the Lord. Let us begin with prayer. Loving God, on this Sunday morning, let us hear your word speaking to us. Sometimes your word, it's a hint, a whisper of a call. Others, like this passage this morning, it's a large yell. Let us hear your direct explanations, your commands. Guide us and live into us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and accepting to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. I've mentioned my alma mater's town, Orange City, Iowa, in previous sermons. But being back there yesterday for my brother's college graduation, it, it reminded me of the unique world it happens to be. And yes, I said yesterday. United Airlines no longer offers non-stops from Newark to Omaha, so most of this sermon was written in the Chicago airport during a layover, hence the haggard eyes. Well, that said, very cool to see my brother graduate from the same college and place that helped shape me. And beyond the professors and peers that challenged and mentored me, the town itself had a way of participating in my formation as well. There's something peculiar about Orange City, so much so that The Atlantic, The New Yorker, and The New York Times, 
they've all written extensively about this town in the last five years. So what does a town of 6,000 people in the middle of northwest Iowa have to do to get the attention of three of the leading magazines and newspapers of our time? And that's just it. They have done nothing to get anyone's attention. They haven't created a marketing campaign or even changed in generations. They are who they are. And who they are is glorious for some and disturbing for others. And before I explain why I think Orange City gets so much attention, let me explain a bit about the town as described in The New Yorker. Orange City, a predominantly Dutch immigrant town, is small and cut off. But unlike such towns, it is not dying. The article goes on to say its Central Avenue is not the hollowed out, boarded up main street of 21st century lore. Along a couple of blocks, there are two law offices, a real estate office, an insurance brokerage, a coffee shop, a sewing shop, a store that sells Bibles and trinkets, a salon, an antique store, the list goes on. All with this exterior facade designed to make you feel that you were back in 17th century Holland. In reality, beyond the Dutch signs and landscape, their downtown reminds me a lot of Metuchen with its small town environment. And for the 6,000 population in Orange City, there are 16 churches. 16 large churches. The town boasts a religious attendance of 99%. Not even their high school graduation rate at 98% can compete. Their unemployment rate is 2%, even amidst a pandemic. There's little crime. None of you will like this next one. The medium income is $60,000, and the average price of a home for three to four bedrooms and a yard $160,000. For the 20% of residents who make more than $100,000, the Dutch frugality means you don't really spend it. And my favorite fun fact of all, when an Orange City teacher wants to divide her class in half alphabetically, she'll say A's through U's on this side, V's through Z's on this side. Vanderwig, Vanderplug, Zilstra, you get the picture. Seems like a nice place. Why all the attention then? Perhaps it is because Orange City and the county it resides in are consistently the most conservative county in our country. For some, this is, this is great. For others, this reality has been a, a nightmare. Up until right before I started attending college there, Orange City had a prohibition on the sale of alcohol within town borders. It still has a no labor law on Sundays, including mowing your lawns. So if you mow your lawn today, you'd get a ticket. When the slapstick humor, albeit crude movie starring Johnny Knoxville came to theaters, Orange City made sure the marquee said Jack Butt instead of the other Jack. Even David Letterman found this to be funny. The town also has a mandate that everyone ought to be attending church. Ideally, a house of worship that reflects their Dutch roots. Orange City is where many Republican presidential candidates begin their campaigns and where new administrative policies are proposed for what many political strategists often consider to be the American people. And as you may imagine, Orange City is predominantly white and uh, defines the acronym WASP, White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And what comes with such homogeneity can be beautiful and loving and idyllic. For example, Orange City emphasizes inclusion for the mentally disabled in their community. But their homogeneity is often a dark, self-serving isolation that only includes you if you look a certain way, talk a certain way, vote a certain way, worship a certain way. They also exclude based upon these parameters. People are declared Christians or heretics based on their theology of the sovereignty of God. For them, if God is entirely in control, they're just disciples following God's will. 
It's as simple as that for them. The point being, a town where there are 16 churches, they often find themselves preaching the opposite of the gospel of Christ that we believe. And from what I've witnessed over the years, they, they exclude excessively. And although I loved my college experience, it was great being there this weekend. The contrast of Orange City to Metuchen, it's drastic. Except for my friend Steve. Steve is an old college roommate of mine who early in his college career, he was so inspired by poet and New York Times award-winning author Kathleen Norris and her challenge for all people to love and serve where you are at. So Steve chose to live in Orange City following graduation. Steve didn't grow up there. Steve isn't conservative. Steve certainly doesn't fit the narrative of if, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. But what Steve is, is a Christian. And he admittedly is an agitator. Steve and his wife chose to open uh, the first coffee shop downtown, and they called it Town Square, amidst all of the Dutch icons and symbols. The premise of the coffee shop being a place where all are welcomed, where love is shown, where community takes place. At first, Orange City embraced this new coffee shop, imported high-quality Brazilian coffee, deli items rivaling any New York bistro. What wasn't there to love? That was until most of the Orange City churches issued a joint memorandum that anyone who identifies as LGBTQ are not welcomed as Christians within their buildings. As wildly hateful as this may seem, it unfortunately followed the SCOTUS Marriage Equality Act. So Steve hung a pride flag and started a gay pride coalition. Recently, when All Lives Matter and even a few White Lives Matter yard signs were placed on church front lawns and littered throughout town, Steve hung a large Black Lives Matter banner. When the town decided that they would not accept any incoming refugees from our southern border, even though the town has a growing Latino population, Steve printed on his coffee sleeves Jesus' words of, I was a stranger, and you let me in, from Matthew 25. When large diesel trucks wielding Confederate flags pulled up and white supremacists threatened his institution, Steve offered them lunch and invited them to talk. When most of the churches issued a boycott on any Christians from supporting his store, Steve never wavered in his principles or service. And most of the town quickly returned to giving him business, if not slightly ashamed, because he is the only coffee shop in town. I asked Steve on Friday, how, how has he done it all? How has he stayed true to loving even his enemies? And I commended him for his Christ-like demeanor. Steve's response surprised me. In his very Steve way, he slammed his fist down and said, interlaced between a few choice vulgarities, that Jesus commands him to love others. That's what he's doing. But Jesus, uh, excuse me, but Justin, these people, and he pointed to a patron in his coffee shop who had an All Lives Matter bumper sticker. These people aren't my enemies. They worship the same Jesus Christ who we worship. They go to the same denominational churches we go to. They may not have my best intentions in mind, but they are friends of God too. We are commanded to love them. I just stared at him. You mean after all they have done to you, you still mean that? Yeah, he responded. Christ commands us to love. Love is the final fight. This is my obligation, he said. I think he stole that line from civil rights activist John Perkins, but the effect was there nevertheless. Love is the final fight. Our passage this morning is a challenging one. Not because we are encouraged or even asked to love. I think we're pretty used to that by now. Jesus tells us often to love others. But this lectionary text is different. Jesus commands us to love. 
I don't know about you, but being commanded what to do isn't exactly a compelling motivation for religion these days. We clergy would much rather implore the people of faith to love and serve out of an understanding that God's love is freely received and should be freely given. But preaching that we should tithe or love our enemies or turn the other cheek because it's in order? Well, I wouldn't consider that to be a greatest preaching hit. But we have the words of Christ to his disciples saying that in order to love Jesus, they must obey him. To me, this feels so counterintuitive. I love Jesus because I understand his sacrifice, his defeat of death, and the example he has set. Therefore, I follow him. The choice to do so is my own. But Jesus is saying here, you don't have to choose me. I already chose you. And because I chose you to love me, you must obey me. If you aren't obeying me, you aren't loving me. Again, it feels weird to be told that we have to love someone. But here goes Jesus demanding this of us. To be a Christian is to be one who obeys Jesus. Uh, fun fact about myself and a self-admission, I hate being told what to do. Fred and Nikki here are nodding emphatically. There's something in me that reacts so strongly to being told to do, well, anything. Theologically, I do everything in my power to frame God as one who is not in control of our lives. Not only do I find that view of God problematic, I don't want to be controlled. So when Jesus commands that for me to truly follow him, I have to do something, I want to run away, not look back. In reality, so many things control us. Our time, our expectations, our work, our phones, our obligations. And that doesn't include all the other external factors that we have no ownership over. If we're willing to admit it, all of us are doing what we are told in some form or another. That is, all of us are living our lives on the basis of some sort of authority outside of us. And some would say there is freedom in that control. Freedom to know what to do and not to do. There are parameters and a safety net to play within. Maybe that's freedom. Maybe it isn't. This isn't the sermon to explore that. Bob Dylan has a song that says, everybody's going to have to serve somebody. I think Bob's on to something. Are we going to serve the things that so often leave us spinning on an endless hamster wheel? Or are we going to serve a person that offers us healing and hope while being part of something bigger than ourselves? Which leaves us feeling more secure? Christ is offering us the parameters to serve him. If we obey Jesus, perhaps we find our true freedom. Perhaps we find our true purpose, abundant life. Perhaps that is what Jesus is offering in today's gospel. Confidence that we know the way because the way has been shown. True light bearers in a dark, aching world. And perhaps Jesus isn't obligating obedience because it is what he expects, but rather because loving one another reveals to the world that God has always been in this struggle with us. And love is the final fight that puts it all back to rights. After all, Jesus' command to love is given by the one who has as himself done everything that love can do. Perhaps loving one another is the balancing point between feeling secure and freedom from control. The hard part about all of this is we Christians are notorious for being the ones that screw it all up. We are commanded to love each other, and we, the ones who openly confess and profess to loving and following Jesus, we find ourselves not obeying. We pretend to do what we're told, but we do a feigned version that reflects more of a self-proclaimed piety than actual love or obedience. In so many ways, the Orange City community, as 
beautiful as it is, it can also just be the worst of us. When too many Christians are fixated on self-preservation, that authority to decide who is in and who is out, it's lurking inside all of us. We have to choose whether or not to succumb to the temptation of control and exclusion. The temptation of thinking we don't have to serve anybody. But then there are the Steves of the world. The ones who follow the commands of Christ to love one another no matter how hard it is. Because that's what he's told to do. I see so much freedom and joy in Steve's life. Passion and direction for something he truly believes in. It doesn't mean Steve has it easy or all is good. His coffee shop is struggling right now. But it does mean we have glimpses of what an abundant life looks like through followers of Christ like Steve. He's in the final fight. May we too obey Jesus Christ for the same reasons and cause. I close with the final verse of our passage. I give you these commands so that you may love one another. Amen. about we rise if you're able imagine you're in a lead car of a parade and uh, you see the parade off to the side and you say uh, peace be with you peace be with you
Let us pray together. Almighty and gracious God, you, you carry us. We are children being carried. Each of us is a child that seeks to rest in your arms. We give you thanks that, that you have brought people into our lives that carry us. And we, we especially remember today the ones who carried us within them. We give you thanks for moms. We pray today that, that you would help us see and understand how we are to walk. Teach us to walk in a way that loves let us lay aside anger and bitterness and greed so we can walk without stumbling. Each of us needs to learn how to walk. God of mercy, help us today to open our eyes and our ears and, and find the world creation that you made. Help us today to learn what it means to love one another. We give you thanks for those who stand ready to teach us with their love. Give us your Holy Spirit so that we can learn to do the work, that we can toil to bring the kingdom of God here and now, so that we will make what is good and true and beautiful. Let us work hard for one another and teach us also to rest, to abide in joy, to take delight in one another. We thank you for those who take delight in us. We pray that you would give us the courage and the imagination and the love to take everything that you've given to us and give it away freely, joyfully, Help us to give away the love you've given us. Teach us to give it away in mercy and forgiveness and compassion and tenderness. We give you thanks today for those who offered us love and tenderness. Forgive us when we stumble. when we refuse to love. Forgive us for our brokenness that we make worse in fear. Free us from fear. We give you thanks today for those who have told us don't, don't be afraid. give you thanks for moms today. We lift up this prayer and the prayer your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
sons of God, for this charge and benediction. Christ commands us to love one another. It's our obligation. And it isn't easy. It doesn't necessarily make us successful. It doesn't even mean we're free. But to be a Christian is to obey. But you all know this. You all, as this church, live this out. So you, may you continue in this final fight of love. Go in peace to love and serve. Amen.
we have an intro, but. I'm going to be playing the piano. <laughs> so, okay. I saw her, but then I didn't see her. I think we're okay. ready. So are you going to say, like, this is where the Sunday school is or something? So, yep. okay. so I'm just going to stand here. Good morning, boys and girls. Uh, some of you have been in the choir for years. I miss you so much. I know you miss singing in the choir room. You miss singing in church. And one of the traditions of our church for many, many years was on Mother's Day, we sang the butterfly song. So since we are not singing together, Taylor is going to sing the butterfly song, and I'm not gonna say she's singing it for you, I am saying she's singing it with you, because I'm hoping that you are going to stand, if you know the butterfly song, and you are going to sing it with Taylor. So here's the butterfly song. I thank you, Lord, for giving me wings. And if I were a robin in a tree, I thank you, Lord, that I could sing. And if I were a fish in the sea, I'd wiggle my tail and I'd giggle with glee. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile You gave me Jesus and you made me a child But I just thank you, Father, for making me me If I were a wiggly worm I thank you, Lord, that I could squirm And if I were a crocodile I thank you, Lord, for my big smile. And if I were a fuzzy wuzzy bear, I thank you, Lord, for my fuzzy wuzzy hair. And I just thank you, Father, for making me me. For you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me a child. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. There we have the butterfly song. Thank you, Mrs. Day. See you in Sunday school. Bye.